Let's ready? Let's begin. Welcome back, everybody. So, hopefully you've had a great spring break. I'm right in the middle of grading your midterms. I'm not going to hand them back to you until next week. We're going to have visitors every single day this week. So, I am wise enough to know handing back a midterm on a day that a visitor is here. Um, probably a bad idea. So, let's postpone that. Um, I have gotten through about half of them, and I think you guys have done really well. It wasn't meant to be difficult, so it's meant to basically just measure that you're on track. The next, next exam is going to be harder, and so I'm going to give you more challenging problems, things that you have to estimate, because the material just gets more challenging. So if you think you did really well, as I hope you did, um, keep studying. And this is the part of the semester where um, you get to figure out which side of the fence you live on. So, hopefully you guys are recharged, but we should have another good six weeks of class and I'll be teaching you all the stuff that's going to be on the wall. So the level of that test is far below what we see on the QE. So, but I'll try to prepare you for that in the next two exams. Okay, let's start out. We're going to be talking about minimal sufficient statistics. We've alluded to it over and over again, what they are. They're the smallest dimensional sufficient statistic. So I'll just point out, the data itself is always sufficient on its own. So the data you get out of the model is going to be sufficient for inferring the model parameters. The model parameters being theta in this case. So if you're thinking about a normal distribution, theta might be mu, the mean of the distribution, or sigma, and or sigma, depending on if you know it. And those will be the things that you're trying to, to estimate. So the data, of course, is sufficient, but the data, the way that I've written it, is n-dimensional. So it's this big vector of data. And the question is, is can we handle something a little bit lighter weight? Can we work with something that's smaller in terms of dimension and still retain all the information about the parameter space? And we already know the, the answer is, in a lot of cases, we can do this and come up with a reduction. And I guess if you're Fisher, that's all very interesting. But to me, it's useful. So there's something I can do with that. So again, sufficiency is something that you have with model in hand. In the real world, data doesn't come with model in hand. And so you're always going to need to keep all of the data to build your model. But once you have your model, then, and if you think it's a good model, you might go back and revise after you do your inferences. And I think that all good modelers do that. It's just a repeated process, revision, refining, building better model. But once you have it, um, if you're operating on a computer, and you're doing something inside a for loop, and you're computing likelihood functions over and over again, having something that takes up less RAM is important. And also being able to reduce the computational cycles is important. And so using a minimal sufficient statistic in your code is super important thing to do. It'll speed it up so that you can actually have less numerical errors and come to your conclusions faster. When I first saw this, sufficient statistics, minimal sufficient statistics, I thought, who cares? So all I'm going to do, most of you know I usually operate as a Bayesian, so I'm going to build a posterior distribution and I condition on the data anyway. And if there is a sufficient statistic in there, whether or not I recognize it, it's still the same posterior distribution. So it doesn't matter. And then I started computing things, and I realized this is actually heavily exploitable this idea. And so it does matter. So maybe from Fisher's perspective, it was just interesting to understand all these various properties of statistics, but we can utilize those properties as well. So I think about this all the time. And usually what I do is I usually just think about the factorization theorem and I mentally see if I can compress the sufficient statistic, how the data is coming. And I'll say something about that in a, more, in a moment, but there's a more formal definition that you would use on an exam to prove that something was minimal sufficient. I'll be teaching you about that. So a sufficient statistic has this property, that if I'm looking at the data, the, pro, the distribution of the data, given whatever your model parameters are, divided by the distribution on the sufficient statistic, so technically this is a different distribution. This is a transformation of that. If the ratio of these two things is a constant, what it's ultimately telling you 
with respect to theta, thinking about this thing as a function of theta, that if this ratio is constant, it means the two likelihood functions have the exact same shape. And they're only off by a normalizing constant. And so that shape of the likelihood, and I want you guys to think about that over and over again, that's where all the info is coming from. So that's the big point I'll be making in this class is the shape of the likelihood is probably the most important thing in inference. And then what you do with that, we'll have to discuss. So in chapter seven, we'll be going through lots of different estimation techniques and the various ways that we can exploit likelihood functions. We'll also be seeing what happens if you do not use likelihood functions. Usually not that great of things can happen. Sometimes in some cases it can work out for you though. Okay, so we know this, we're familiar with this. And directly from this, we were able to prove that if this is true, it means that something is factorizing out in terms of the sufficient statistic and the parameter that is canceling out in that ratio so that this thing is a constant. And so this is a direct result from that. And it's an if and only if statement. So if this is a constant, that factorization exists. If this factorization exists, that thing's a constant. Christiana, our guest, I said that really fast. So I think I said it over the course of three weeks before all of this. So if that seemed like a lot to digest, it is. So, but um, that's where we're at. Okay, so this is all stuff that we know. And so I wanna just kind of look at this for a second in terms of an example. So let's look at this example. Xi's are distributed according to a Poisson distribution. So this is my theta in this case, the lambda parameter, that's my one parameter in this model. I'll just remind us, everything's IID in this case. Nothing I've said over here requires IID-ness, but I'm just gonna invoke it for these examples. I get to see end data points out of this model. So I'll just remind us that lambda has to be positive. It doesn't have to be strictly positive, it could be zero. And so usually I don't write that down because if it were zero, again, what Poisson's are is their counts. And so the expected value is lambda. which is also equal to the variance. And so if lambda was zero, there's zero variability in the data and the expected value is zero. So that means every entry is zero. So usually I don't model that as Poisson. I just say it's zero. So I usually don't write that in. Um, I'll just write out the distribution looks like this f of xi given lambda is e to the minus lambda, lambda to the xi divided by xi factorial, where the xi's are count. And we can go on and so on, so on and so forth. Um, I like to say lots of things about Poisson models. This isn't the lecture for that. So I'm gonna assume you have some basic familiarity with this model and you've certainly played around with it a little bit, but there's all kinds of things you can do. Sometimes there is an overabundance of zeros in a Poisson model. And so usually what you do is you work with a mixture model of something where there's a point mass of zero and then the rest of the stuff that's non-zero is distributed according to a Poisson. And your name of your game is to figure out those mixture components. I'll be teaching about that once we get to chapter seven. So we'll re-explore this in the mixture context later on. Um, I like to say lots of things about this as well. You know, whether or not that's a reasonable assumption, that's something that happens. So there's another phenomenon where sometimes in your data, if you looked at your data and the variance was much higher than the expectation, that's called an overdispersed count distribution, and those obviously are not Poisson. But mixtures, scale mixtures of Poisson, so if I mix over this parameter in a scale mixture format, and I'll teach you what that is later on, you can induce things like negative binomial models that are overdispersed. So this is the foundational counting model, and most things can be derived from that. 
If you live in a situation where the variance is much smaller than the x i's, that doesn't belong to an exponential family, and that can be proved. So if you did see that, you're probably thinking something like a mixture, like a zero inflated Poisson model. So that might reduce the variability of things. So all kinds of stuff we could talk about. If you're taking the stochastic process class, um, you would probably learn something about Poisson processes and their counting processes over time, and it relates to this model. So again, this model is really foundational, but we're going to use it in its simplest format today. We'll say more about that later. Um, so that's what this looks like. Let's just look at this ratio real quick. So if I wrote this down, um, let's just say I maybe know what t of x is in this case. So let me just query you guys. What's sufficient in this model? Can you tell just by looking at it? Some of the x's. Some of the x's. You're good. So you probably needed to look at the product for a second over everything, and then you can figure out that some of the x's is sufficient. And so some of the x's is sufficient. We'll see that in a second something that some of you are already privy to. Um, and so some of you might know that the maximum likelihood estimator is sum of the xi's divided by n, which is a function of that sufficient statistic. And so it's also sufficient if it's a one-to-one -one transform with a sufficient statistic. They have the same information. And so the sufficient statistic isn't what we use directly to infer uh, our model parameters but rather we do something with it. And that's gonna be what chapter seven's all about. So you might know this. Um, let me just ask you a question. What's the distribution of some of the exiles? It's also a Poisson. So I'm counting things, and if I'm adding things together that I'm counting, I'm really just counting again. And so this would be Poisson. Does anybody know which Poisson it is? And lambda. Very good. So if the expectation is lambda, you can think about it this way, and I'm adding these things together, and I'm adding n things together, then the expectation should be n lambda if they're identical processes. So I think that all makes sense. These are things you might know already. But if you didn't know this, you might think, OK, I can use the conceptual sort of quick glance at this and convince myself if it's Poisson. If you don't know that, do the transformation directly. And you've got lots of different ways you can do it. You can do it from scratch, you can use your convolutional formulas, so on and so forth. Those are all good practice problems. Okay, so let's just glance at this thing real quickly. Um, I can write down what f of x is given lambda, and this is just going to be the product of all the fxi's given lambda, because everything is iid. So it looks like this. e to the minus lambda, lambda xi over xi factorial. There's something really nice in here that when I see factorials, it usually freaks me out. Because I'm thinking when I take this to a computer and I encode everything, factorials aren't numerically very stable. They grow very fast. So let me just ask you a question. On a computer, what's the biggest number of a factorial that you can input and think that it's actually reliable when the computer spits out? Obviously, one factorial your computer can handle is one. Two factorial, your computer can probably handle without any numerical problems. Two times one is two. So three factorial is six. Your computer isn't going to bark at that. So, but as I keep producting more and more things in there, the computer is going to struggle. What's about the biggest number? There was an exercise I did when I was in college where they asked this question on a computer and they said try to create a vector to store all the little decimal places so that you're not using double precision computing and you're just re-encoding all of that so you can have higher precision computing. It's a fun exercise, I remember just really loving it. 
But I did learn the answer, at least back in the day, and that was roughly 20 plus years ago. So things have gotten a little bit faster. At the time, it was like 52 factorial was the biggest number you could use. Now it's probably like 100, something like that. So a lot of times people are using approximations of factorial called Sterling's approximation. What I love about this, when I write out this joint distribution, or I think about it as a likelihood function when I think about it in terms of lambda, there's no lambdas right here. And so in terms of computing, I can throw that thing away. So almost always, it's part of the normalization factor in some ways. So it doesn't depend on the parameter space, and it doesn't tell us information about the parameters. Instead, all the parameters appear here. So this thing right here is e to the minus lambda n, and I'm going to do a quick reduction. So it just simplifies all of this. Lambda to the um, sum of the xi's divided by this thing right here, xi factorial. So all the action, all the shape in terms of lambda is in the numerator, and those are all things that we can compute really easily. Um, I'll just remind you, anytime I see things in the exponent or I see an e, I take a logarithm in practice. So we won't do that here because we won't have any numerical issues. But if you ever do encode this stuff on a computer, you'll want to take a logarithm. Otherwise, you'll spend 25 hours trying to figure out what's wrong with something. So it's up to you. So this part right here, this is g t of x given lambda. And this part is just a function that only depends on h of x. So going back to the factorization theorem, this decomposition, this is all sitting right here. And we can see in terms of the xi's themselves, the only part that matters is that. So I could write on the chalkboard this or that, but what I would encode on a computer is probably a form using that because I wouldn't need to deal with the xi's, I wouldn't need to deal with a product in every single step. Instead, I could just sum up the xi's and know what that is throughout my analysis and just store that in my computer code. And so, and I could recognize that through the factorization theorem, which is probably what you did in your mind when you decided some of the xi's is sufficient because I just rolled the product and solved the simplification. That's what I do. But if I were on a test, I'd need to be more formal about that. Okay, so you can convince yourself through this analysis right here that this ratio is going to be a constant because everything appears through the sum of the xi's. We could do that more formally if you wanted to. Um, we know that lambda is one dimensional. We know that sum of the xi's is one dimensional, so obviously we can't reduce that any further. And so that is going to be minimal sufficient as well. Um, here's the definition of the book. So, definition. A minimal sufficient statistic. of x is a function of any other sufficient statistic. So this is kind of like just as useful as that early definition of sufficient statistics where they write it down and they talk about the conditional distribution of x on t of x and it's free of the parameter. And that's the same thing as writing down this ratio right here. And so we had to chew on that definition for a while for it to make sense. Now I think it makes sense. Uh, this definition is almost just as elusive. It's like, okay, well, what do I do with that? But let's just think about what it's saying. Um, the x's are sufficient, we already know that. And this is a function of a sufficient statistic. So this falls into that category. And so what it means is I can map any other sufficient statistic to this thing 
and I'll still retain all the information because it's a mapping from any other submission statistic. So it retains the same information. Um, I don't know if that's super useful to think about it that way, but it's true. And you can kind of see it here. It means that if I have a sufficient statistic, I'll be able to compute the minimal sufficient statistic, but not necessarily the other way around. And so let's just grow this example a little bit. So we know that the x's are sufficient. We know that all of these various sums, I could have x1, I could have x2, or I could, have, and I could have sum from i goes from 3 to n, sum of the xi's. This is also sufficient. So this is sufficient. That's also sufficient. And why is it sufficient? Because if I had this, I could compute some of the xi's. It's sufficient. If I have this thing right here, a three-dimensional thing, I can compute with this by adding this to that to that and get some of the xi's. That's also sufficient. So all three, all of those are sufficient. I could do this in a lot of different ways, but this isn't minimal sufficient because I can't take this and reform that. I can't take some of the xi's and retell you what x1, x2, and some of the x3 through xn is. But I can't go the other direction. So given these things, I can tell you what that is right here. So this is not minimal sufficient because it fails the test. Some of the xi's are sufficient, and I can't recover that from it. And so it's just a mapping of all that information, and I preserved all that information through the mapping. That's what this says. And I can do it lots of different ways. Okay, here's a more useful definition. And if we come to a test and I ask you to demonstrate something is minimal sufficient, what I'll probably do come like QE time or towards the final or maybe midterm two, is I'd say identify a sufficient statistic, identify the minimal sufficient statistic. What you would probably do is the factorization theorem. And then you would verify it's minimal sufficient. So you'd probably do this sort of mental thing where you would just look through this and go, I think that's minimal sufficient. I suppose for this example, you could say, well, the parameter space is one dimensional. So that's one dimensional. It can't go any further, so it's minimal sufficient. I'd be hoping you would actually formally demonstrate this, but that's perfectly sound logic. So probably what I'll do is give you um, a problem where you need like a two-dimensional sufficient statistic or something to estimate something that's one-dimensional. We'll see an example like that in a moment. Um, so this is how you verify minimal sufficiency. And this is what they also present in the book. So um, I'll just say minimal sufficient statistic. This is another operational definition that f of x given theta, so those are our model parameters, divided by f of y given theta. This is going to be a constant. We already know this is going to be a constant if we're just plugging in two sequences of data. They have the same information. But there's going to be a condition that they attach to this. This is a constant if and only if t of x is equal to t of y. So this is a function of the data right here. And this thing right here is going to be min sufficient. That function t of x. So in the context of our Poisson example, t is the sum. That's that operator. So this is what this says that this thing will be a constant if this condition is true right here, and the other way around. If this condition is true, then this thing will be a constant. If we can say that, then we say t is minimal sufficient. That might not gel yet. Let's just look at an example and see how this kind of plays out. There is a proof of this statement in the book. I kind of find it too obvious to add a proof to, 
Um, but if you guys do want to cycle through that proof, that's fine. I'm going to try to explain this to you in a way that you could reconstruct that proof. But I'm not going to test you on that proof. I just want you to understand this, where it all comes from. Um, this is almost like this condition right over here. So if I'm kind of thinking about the data x, and then I have like a permutation of the data down here, right here, and I call that y, this thing would be a constant if everything was iid, everything would be exchangeable in that fashion. Um, and so that thing would be a constant. So this original statement, this thing right here, so I'll call this one, and I'll call this two, this is the sufficient condition for something to be a sufficient statistic. I kind of really like that. This is the necessary condition. This is the tightest constraint on the sufficient condition, sufficient statistic. So this statement right here is just telling you something is sufficient in the first place. This is telling you what the binding constraint is on sufficiency. So let's look at this in terms of the Poisson example. This one takes a little bit of a mental exercise to kind of think your way through. And every problem will be a little bit different. So back to our example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about the model and I'm going to consider two auxiliary data sets. I don't actually need the data to do this. I just need to think about where the data is, would be coming from. So I'm going to think about x is just some vector of data and y is some other vector of data. They have the same sizes. The question is, is when do these two vectors of data have the same information about our model parameter? And they have the same information about the model parameter if the ratio of these two things is constant because they'll have the same likelihood shapes. So that's a statement about sufficiency. So let's just write this down. F of x given lambda, that's our model parameter, so I'm substituting theta for lambda. This thing is just going to look like this. E to the minus n lambda. I'm just going to write it like that. I'm going to write out that this is going to be E, I'll say lambda to the x i's. i goes from 1 to n. I'll write in my normalizer over here, x i factorial. We won't have to think about it. And down in the bottom, we have something very similar. Lambda to the yi. I goes from 1 to n, and I'm going to divide by my normalizer. And I have to think about what is the if and only if statement here for this thing to be a constant. If it's a constant, then I know that these two things have the same information about lambda because they have the same shapes. And I have to think about what the most restrictive condition is on the x's and the y's. This could be a constant if the xi's and the yi's are equal to each other. So let's just write that down. Little kids, huh? They start early around here. We must have a field trip. <laughs> <laughs> we start our recruiting pretty young. <laughs> okay. So the question is, what's the binding constraint? So t of x is equal to t of y, such that this thing is a constant. The constant part just tells us that it's sufficient. So I could have x i are equal to the y i's for all i. i goes from 1 to n, and this thing would be a constant right here. 
because they're all the same values. This product would be that right there. No big deal. Everything would be the same. But this isn't necessary. This is sufficient. For this to be equal to a constant, I'll call that my first condition. So this is sufficient for one, but it's not necessary. I don't need the data to be exactly the same. I could end up reordering everything, possibly. I could look at this product down here and kind of realize, well, it doesn't matter which order this comes in. I learned back in second grade that I can exchange the order of multiplication. There's some name for that property and it's still the same product. So everything commutes. So I could have this, the order statistics. So I could shuffle everything. Um, reorder everything, and if they're equal to each other, for i goes from one to n, then this is sufficient for one, and this would still be a constant. And so the order statistics are sufficient in this case, and we could have told you that it's because of exchangeability. Things are ID, they're exchangeable, I can reorder everything and still have the same information, but this isn't necessary. I don't need the ordering of everything to be, this, to be the same for this thing to be a constant. If I rewrite everything like this, I can start to see what the condition is. So I'll rewrite this, e to the minus n lambda over e to the minus, give myself a little bit more room. could have rewrite everything to so make it all look like this. e to the minus n lambda, lambda to the sum of the xi's, i goes from 1 to n, divided by these things right here that we really don't even need to think about. These don't involve lambda themselves, so they don't interfere with this ratio being a constant one way or the other. So we don't even need to think about them, but it is technically correct to write them down. And so what we realize is all we really need for this thing to be a constant is that this needs to be equal to that. And that's what this says. But if sum of the xi's is equal to sum of the yi's, then one holds, i.e. that ratio is a constant. And that's the binding condition. I don't really have a good way to do this other than to use your mental powers to kind of inspect what is the necessary condition for this thing to be a constant. And so if this is true, then this thing is a constant, and that's the necessary condition. That's what a minimal sufficient statistic is all about. So again, what you'll do in practice is you'll probably employ the factorization theorem, do a simplification of everything, use your mathematical prowess of addition and product, and then realize what is the smallest dimensional thing, and then argue that this thing right here is a constant if and only if those two things are equal to each other. And that will identify the minimal sufficient statistic for you. Let's look at one more example. This one's always fun. So Koshi is for This is another one of my favorite distributions. I use them all the time in practice. 
So f of xi, and I'll give it just a shift. So this is a shift in Cauchy distribution. Um, this is going to look like this. Proportional to 1 plus 1 minus theta squared to the minus 1. So this is what a Cauchy distribution looks like it's been shifted. So this looks like this. Is what that shape looks like. Um, I wrote down the proportionality sign. Let me be a little bit um, more formal about all of this and write in my normalizing constant. Again, as you've noticed in all these exercises, the normalizer doesn't do anything. So, it doesn't tell you anything about anything. So that's why we're always throwing away the normalizing constants and writing down under proportionality. Does anybody know what the normalizing constant is for Cauchy? I'm just curious. Yeah, nobody ever remembers these things. And the reason why is because you don't really need to know. It's one over pi. You can look that up. So, if I think about this thing, f of x, over f of y, given theta, this is going to look like this. So I always start with the, just how I form this thing, I usually work with a product. That's what I always do, and then I see if there's a simplification. I goes from 1 to n, and I'm just going to write all these things in. 1 over pi, 1 plus, oops, this is not a 1. There's my x. Oh, it's funny. Sam's puzzled face is what did it for me. <laughs> to the minus one, one over pi, one plus yi minus theta squared to the minus one. Again, the normalizing constants don't do anything for you. They don't tell you anything. It doesn't have any of the relationship with theta in there. So we can just get rid of them, and that's usually what I do. The question is, is could you simplify this into some reduced form that contains just some function of the xi's and the y's? And it's a hard question to answer. So as to whether or not you can do this. Carol knows the answer. I know the answer. You can't do it. How do you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, we've, we've talked about it anyway, I said, but I never proved it to you, that it couldn't be done. This is not a polynomial, or I guess it can be expressed in terms of a big, you know, we could probably tailor expand it into a polynomial, but it's not a polynomial or something. We can't reduce it, and so no matter how hard you try, or no matter how many mathematical friends you have um, that know everything about number theory, that you could come up with, they would never be able to simplify this into a function of the xi's or the yi's, where this thing is a constant, you can't reduce this any further. And so, how do you know these things? I guess you need to know a number theorist to be able to prove that in great detail. Let me ask you a, a, an easy mathematical question. How do you know that negative one times negative one is equal to one? This is about the level we're talking. And the proof of that is not that hard, but you'd need to convince somebody of it. These are one of these things that we might take for granted. What does it mean to be negative one? Something about direction. So this is the level of the proof I'm going to give you. You just can't do it. But I'm sure that the proof is actually pretty long to show that you cannot factorize that in any nice way and get a reduction. And so I don't actually need the xi's to be equal to identically the y's. They don't need to come in the same order. Because everything is written down in a product, I can shuffle the order. And so we might say that the x, the order statistics, i goes to 1 to n, if they're equal to each other, I can shuffle this order, and this thing will be a constant. 
and there's no other reduction that you can come up with. So in this case, you might say the order statistic is sufficient. When people say that to me, I think, oh, there's no reduction, and this is probably an IID model. It's at least exchangeable. So in this case, the order statistic is sufficient. You can scramble the order and you still have all the same information. That's kind of surprising. So at first, but there is no reduction there. Can anybody think of any other models where there's not reductions in terms of the dimensionality of everything? How about a reliable distribution? Are you familiar with that? So reliability theory, if you take a reliability class, you'll probably be playing around with those sort of things. Here's something interesting. Um, exponential families have reductions. So in things that fall outside of the exponential family usually don't have reductions. And at least you can't say anything in general. So that's kind of where we come up with some of that theory. And we say exponential families and writing things out into these canonical forms is important and you can lend all of that to you know your computation so you can take it onto a computer use less ram um, use less cycles to do all your computing not working through all the products and so that stuff is useful and there are general underlying theories that say when these reductions exist and if you take a more theoretical class they might prove back to you, that an exponential family does fall into that. So there are reasons that we come up with these big umbrellas over these different distributional classes. Some of those things are a little bit more useful than just being interesting. So I used to think in my first year of graduate school, who cares if I can write everything out as a canonical form and that, like, what is this exercise all about? Later on, I learned out that, oh, all distributions that fall into this class have this form, and I can use it and exploit it. And it became a little bit more useful to me. Okay, so that's minimal sufficiency. I think if there's anything else I want to say about that. Let's look at another example. This example is in your book. This is the prelude to ancillary statistics, so I'll be saying more about that next time. But ancillary statistics are quite the opposite of sufficient statistics, that they don't have any information about the parameter space on their own. That's important. So they can be utilized. So, and I'll say more about it uh, next time. Okay, here's my example. We'll come back around to this example in the context of ancillary statistics next time. So have a look at this example in the book because I'm gonna be pulling out, remember that triangular distribution with the range and the mid-range? It's gonna be very similar to that example. And that example looked like this. Don't write this down yet. We studied this example. Zero and theta right here. And we worked out, you know, um, what the transformation of the range and the mid-range are. Um, we're gonna do that exact same thing, but we're gonna change this a little bit, but all that math we did and that transformation of variables, I'm not gonna repeat it. In the next lecture, we're still gonna get that same beta distribution looking thing at the end of the day when we marginalize across the mid-range. And so this example is just a little bit different. This is gonna be beta minus one, to theta plus one. Actually, I'm gonna change this because I think that's what they have in the book. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So it doesn't really matter, but it will mess up my scaling if I do it wrong. And so this is different than the other example. And so uh, in our old example, that I just wrote down and I erased, theta was operating as a scale parameter. Is theta a scale parameter still when I write it out this way? It's not. So if I take a uniform zero one and I multiply it by theta, it's gonna be a uniform zero theta, so that's scaling. This is a shift, the way that we've encoded it. 
So this is a uniform distribution centered around theta. Theta over two. They, well, we'll just start. The average of these two things. So xi is going to live between theta and theta plus one. And this is going to be true for all of the xi's. I goes from one to n. So let's just think about what this says. If that's true for all of them, then I know that um, the maximum, the maxes of the x's, my whole collection, is going to be less than theta plus 1. And the minimum of the x's is going to be greater than theta. So that's true. And so and we can play around with that. The minimum we'll call x1, and we'll call this xn right there. And we can re-encode all of this, and we can solve for theta right here. So I know that x1, I'll say this, theta is less than or equal to x1, the minimum. And I can rewrite this by writing a minus 1 on the left-hand side and subtracting that positive 1 over here. So theta is greater than the maximum, minus 1. The density looks like this. F of x, i given theta looks like it's equal to 1. So it's a uniform distribution. The interval length is 1. It's centered around theta. And so its density height is 1. If I stared at this for a second, I would think there's no dependence on theta in all of this. And there obviously is a dependence on theta. It shows up on the boundary condition of the problem. I love these problems when I give you guys tests because all kinds of weird issues show up when you have your parameter on the boundary of, of the problem. We'll be seeing those problems throughout this, the remainder of this class. So real quickly, what's minimal sufficient for this problem? Could you tell just by glancing? You probably need to write out Maybe the factorization theorem. So I'll just write out f of x given theta. This is equal to the product of f of x i's given theta is equal to the product i goes from 1 to n, 1, right here. And we've seen this already. This is the error to write this down. And the reason you know this is an error, because there's a theta over here. And you haven't written down anything in terms of theta. So if I'm thinking about the likelihood function, um, there's no parameter in there. That can't be the likelihood. So that's the second biggest error that people make in this class, sometimes writing this thing down like this. So what do I need to do? I need to include the boundary condition in all of this. And so this is going to be the delta function. I'm just going to use this as an indicator. It's a 1 if the thing in the interior is true, and it's a 0 otherwise. And so this will just look like this. Theta is less than or equal to xn minus 1. Theta is less than the, the, the minimum. That all looks good to me. So, at the end of the day, this thing is just this. Xn minus 1, less than or equal to theta, less than or equal to x1. So somebody tell me real quickly after staring at this, what's the minimal sufficient statistic? Yeah, it's the min and the max. So, x1 and xn are min sufficient. 
for this problem. And it's because I can write it out that way. You can go back to the formal definition and convince yourself that that's true and there's no other reduction. So that means that the range, which is x n minus x1 in the mid range, xn plus x1 divided by 2, these are also minimal sufficient. Why is that true? It's a function of minimal sufficient statistics. And so it's a one-to-one -one transformation. If I give you these, you could solve for xn and x1. If I gave you xn and x1, you could solve for those. So they have exactly the same information. What we're going to learn next time, and this is what you might want to study over the book, is R on its own, the range, doesn't tell you anything about theta. And so we'll work through, the book works through it, but we've already done that math, what the distribution of the range is, and what we'll find out is theta doesn't appear in that distribution. That's going to mean that it's ancillary. Uh, saying that, the range obviously has some information about theta because used in conjunction with the mid-range, it tells you everything. And so there's a theorem in the book called Basu's theorem, which we will not be proving, we won't be covering, but this goes back to Fisher's thinking about statistics. What's the relevance of all of this? You might be inclined to think that the ancillary statistics and the min sufficient statistics live in completely non-overlapping spaces because one has all the information and the other one doesn't. There's another definition in the book called completeness, and I don't want you to focus on it too much. I'm not going to test you on it other than the definition, just so you know what it is. But don't spend your time there because it has no statistical application. It does tell you something interesting, though, is to win the ancillary statistics in the minimal sufficient statistics live in completely non-overlapping spaces. This is an example. You can kind of see that the range shouldn't tell you anything about theta because theta is a location parameter. And the range is telling you something about scale. So it's a little bit different. If we re-encoded this to zero theta, the range does have information. So and we've seen that before. So look at that example so that we can cut down on the transformational map. I don't have to do that transformation. But the marginal distribution of R will still look like a beta distribution. And it'll still have that exact same form that we studied a moment ago. That's it for now, you guys. I'll see you on Wednesday.